quality which needn't be mentioned. On a street with no name, there is a house without a number. souvenirs. See? A few trusts uh, borrowed from a back cupboard of a black chamber just for this occasion. A surgically extracted bullet from an assassin's pistol. A single bullet which won an entire war. Decorations of the highest orders in honor of one of the most hated men in his country. As for this, this is a milestone. Oh, I should say a kilometer stone, but it comes from France. Interesting point about this stone is that it wasn't where it should have been. If you can't depend on a milestone marking a mile, what can you depend on? Well, you can depend on this. That because of these trivial things, a strange man named Wilhelm Steiber laid the very foundation of the science of espionage as we know it today. In doing so, he brought about the overthrow of an emperor made it possible for Prussia to crush France in six weeks, united a loose federation of states into a formidable nation called Germany, a nation which twice in the next 70 years opposed and nearly conquered the entire world. Wilhelm Steiber, the father of all modern spies, was an ambitious man. In June of 1867, he had achieved a moderate success in furnishing the Prussian army with some confidential information which they had used in crushing Austria. Though Steiber was not generally known at this time, those who could make use of his services were well aware of him. For example, a very hungry man, General Prince Otto Edward von Bismarck. If, on paper, the king was all important, in reality, Prince Bismarck was the head of the Prussian state. All the power which the crown controlled passed through his hands. Not since the first Napoleon had man learned so well the art of war. Already Bismarck had carved up the map of Europe. Already he had ingested Austria, and still he was hungry. And make no mistake about Bismarck, this man had an unlimited appetite. Steiber. Yes, Excellency. I am going to make a war, and you are going to help me win it. I want Alsace-Lorraine. Do you think the French will give it up without a war? <laughs> I don't think so. Even that imbecile who calls himself the third Napoleon would have to fight for that. Well, when I am ready, which will be when the Frenchman is not. What can I provide, Excellency? A map of every road and cow path in France. A list of every fortification. The strength of every garrison. The position of every regiment. And the state of its reserves. I want to know the equipment of every soldier, his morale, the condition of his commissary. Crops, which are in abundance and which are not. Factories. What strategic materials are being made and where? I want the personal habits, peculiarities, and state of mind of every officer in the French army, from the rank of sub-lieutenant on up. This alleged Napoleon has political advisers. How do they think? What do they want? Who despises whom? Of course. I will need money. You have it? I will need authority. You have it? I have enemies. I will need your support. You have it. At your service, Excellency. I'm the Herr Daba. Excellency. You will report to me personally. Specific. We will require as follows. In all, a minimum of 30,000 agents, 45,000 farmers, market gardeners, hired men, and vine growers, seven to 9,000 female domestics for service in restaurants, cafes, and hotels. And wherever these women are posted in garrison towns, they will be pretty. 
We will have six to seven hundred retired French non-commissioned officers who will take jobs in factories and offices. One thousand commercial travelers. And German governesses must become fashionable. The children of every French official must feel neglected without them. These will be the nucleus of an army, an invisible army. The report of each agent will be contained in separate ledgers here. Each report will be cross-indexed and recorded in a master catalogue. They will be encoded and catalogued. And these shelves will be filled with our catalogues. In short, a network, a nervous system, a ganglia with a central brain. And the brain is here and here. For two years, the three Germans marched and countermarched across the map of France, posing mostly as surveyors. They marked the way the roads ran, where they bent and where they crossed, which could be used for supply trains, which the shortest route for cavalry, which for infantry. And in the course of their mapping, they discovered a fact which even the French general staff did not know. The kilometer posts in the north of France were more than a kilometer apart. For two years, Steiber and company lived in France, stopping a while at odd places. Who didn't like the genial Prussian traveling salesman? What if he was a little odd? If he waked at six and walked the country roads for hours before breakfast? Didn't this prove his love of the French countryside? Was there ever a man who listened so fully, so interested in history, geography, tiny details of the routine events of the country? Oh, Herr Steiber, we will meet you. We must keep in touch with each other. You must write to me. Oh, I will write to you. I will write you everything. <laughs> Take my address. Sometimes a spy is told part of the truth. After all, candor has value, too. Here's the address of the factory where I want you to go to work. Each week you will submit to me a detailed report on exactly how much is manufactured and, if possible, to whom it is consigned. In other words, you want me to be a spy? Of course. For being which you will be well paid. A hundred francs a week. I don't like being a spy. My dear sir, you don't understand. It is in the nature of a business to wish information on the activities of one's competitors. The firm which I represent must have such information, or it would go out of business. And sometimes a spy is a spy. Understand, Monsieur Gauger, I don't want just any governess. It must be a Prussian governess. What is there about these girls? It's becoming a fad. What's her name? Helta. She is Prussian. Oh. I swear, Monsieur Gauger, you have absolutely cornered the market on the Prussian girls. Uh, you. Uh, Hertha. Uh, stand up. Come over to the window. Stand in the light. Are your teeth good? Open your mouth. I just can't bear a girl with bad teeth. Yes. Very well. You may give her my address. She can come to us tomorrow morning before noon. Good day. Good day. The Baroness's husband is a very important man. They say he has the ear of the Emperor himself. It is also possible that the Emperor's words find their way to the Baron's ears as well. Yes, yeah. Now you see how it's done, don't you? The technique was really quite simple. In two years, three energetic travelers can cover quite an expanse of territory. And wherever they passed, they made friends, or bought friends. And they didn't stop there. For Steiber and company even bought little pieces of France. They became men of property. From countless staid companies with conservative French names and secret German owners, information flowed like water over a dam. Was it a good or a bad year for the wine growers? Were the cows fat or lean? What was being built? What contracts were the government letting out? Who was living and who was dead? Did anyone need a new servant? 
Why not a nice, attractive, helpful Prussian spy? And that's the way the information was gathered. It poured in by the sheaf until eventually there were trunks full of it. Trunks full of treason. And it was to be exported by the boldest of means. Have you anything to declare, gentlemen? Uh, nothing. You're certain? Uh, dear sir, we have nothing in our trunks but souvenirs. Ah, souvenirs. To what value? Of no intrinsic value, purely sentimental. Surely, then, you do not object to inspection? By all means. Dear yes, sir, we have so many souvenirs, we can easily spare something. Help yourself to whatever pleases you. But there are three trunks. Of course. As you say, gentlemen, objects of purely sentimental value. <laughs> yes. Though the shooting would not start for another three years, the Franco-Prussian War had begun. Though the French would not know it for three years, they were in a war. A strange, silent war in which, as the opening salvo, 165 reports were fired. In 1868, the single most effectively destructive enemy which France had was Wilhelm Steiber, the master spy who operated as a file clerk. But Steiber himself was not without enemies. To the regret of the Prussian officer caste, all too frequently they were forced into personal contact with Steiber, and they did not like it. I have a report for Prince von Bismarck. I'll take it. I report directly to His Excellency. Suit yourself. I gather Wilhelm Steiber is not liked here by some. My impression is that Steiber submits a great deal of information. Much of it is correct. I'll grant him that. One uses Steiber's information and yet one despises Steiber. How does this happen? One tolerates yours because yours are necessary. Yet a sewer has a disagreeable odor, and one ignores it where possible. You are a dull man, General Browner. Even your insults lack invention. Well, well, I hadn't realized that how Steiber could be insulted. Report concerning General Graf von Browner. And though the subject gives the impression of leading a circumspect life, in fact, he is extremely friendly with a certain coarse woman of low class. This fact is unknown to his wife. This is blackmail. A little farther down in my report. General Graf von Brauner handles not only his own accounts, but the accounts and monies of his wife's estates. By close reckoning, a certain sum of 20,000 marks belonging to the Countess von Brauner seems to have disappeared in a rather inexplicable manner. The Countess von Brauner has several times asked embarrassing questions concerning this sum, but as of this moment, the general has succeeded in satisfying her curiosity. This is blackmail. There is more. It is noteworthy that 18,000 marks have been credited to the account of the woman mentioned above by an admirer. Now, this fact the woman speaks of generally and without hesitation. I'll kill you. On my honor as an officer, I'll kill you. I think not. There are copies. While Steiber, the file clerk, laboriously gleaned every stray piece of information for his ledgers, France went about its daily business with no idea of the army which had invaded it. The secret army which had already mobilized within her borders.
So this is the Frenchman's secret weapon. With a bore this small and a bayonet this long, it strikes me he's come up with a rather expensively engineered spear. You will excuse me, Brano, but notice this rubbering here in the breach. This seals it against escaping gas. So increased bullet velocity. What bullet? 11 millimeters? And you must load it one at a time, the same as a Prussian. When our Prussian has exhausted his ammunition, your Frenchman will still have 15 rounds in his pouch. Excellent. Sir. Why do you think they reduced the caliber of this gun? So that every man may go into action with 90 rounds to our 75. Of course, they're individual firepower. 20% greater than ours. Just because here, Napoleon's weapon is no longer a secret is no reason we should increase its effectiveness by underestimating it. I was not aware. No, but you are aware now. Only because this intelligence and this gun were delivered to us by a man I believe you shudder to invite to your own home. Stiber. And you, Herr General, how long would it take the French reserves to march from Cambrai to Valenciennes? The distance of 20 kilometers. The French infantry makes a forced march at 5 kilometers an hour. In summer, with no rain, four hours. Six. But the distance from Cambrai is... 20 kilometers on the map. But what is the distance on foot? I will tell you. It is 30. Impossible, Excellency. Those are French maps. Then let us hope they believe those maps. Nearly every kilometer post in France is more than a kilometer from the next. They have been measured by Herr Steiber. Ah, Steiber. He's a civilian. Yes, the civilian who discovered that every unit of the French army cannot possibly arrive anywhere on time if it depends on its own maps. Uh, gentlemen, do not underestimate Herr Steiber. He may turn out to be your secret weapon. I'm very busy. You'll have to come back. Monsieur, please don't send me away. Only listen to my story. Can't you see I'm occupied? I have a client. I'm, I'm desperate, monsieur. If, if only you would listen to me, you, you would see how, how urgent it is. Very well. I'm not a villain. Here. Fill out a form. my best agent. Would I have taken the first train from Paris if I were not sure? I traveled all night and all day. And then at the frontier... I'm I... not interested in your itinerary. The note is authentic. Quite so. Good work. Go get yourself some sleep. Is it cold out? Quite cold. Well, winter's coming on at that. Information is exact. It will happen. Uh, no portfolio this time, I see. I must beg your excellency's pardon for a visit at this hour. Well, I assume it is important. I rely on your judgment, Steiber. I have just received word from Paris that an attempt is going to be made to assassinate Alexander of Russia when he visits France. I know about the assassination attempt. I've known it for some time. Schneider, do you know how I know you are my best sort of information? Because I check on those that are doing the checking, and I check on those, too. I am flattered, but bizarre. Assassination is only another form of diplomacy. When we engage the Frenchman, we had better make sure that the Frenchman's friend, the Russian, does not attack us from the rear. In fact, 
It would be better if the Frenchman did not have a friend. It would indeed. So, how to neutralize an ally. If on a visit to France, the Tsar of all the Russia should be attacked by a citizen of France, how long would the guest remain friendly toward the host? I understand, Excellency. I shall forget the information and I shall do nothing. I did not say that. The assassination must be attempted, but it must not go through. The assassin must be caught and tried by a French court. <laughs> that should make the victim really angry. But, Excellency, a court, any court, would have to convict. Would it? What is a court? People and a judge? Cannot justice be bought? And if it must be bought, Herr Steiber? Do you not know the right people? Just see that the assassination is attempted, but do not let it succeed. See that the bullet is fired, but see that it never reaches its mark, like a miracle, Steiber. An act of God. Hey, Steiber. Excellency. How does it feel to be an agent of God? Hmm? Though Paris was a large city, even at that time, Steiber's hidden army was equal to the task of following a single man. Steiber's men were masters of the secret art of surveillance. For days, wherever the potential assassin went, one of Steiber's army was on his heels. Friendless, the assassin may have been, but never could he say he was alone. Hourly reports were made at the headquarters set up at Gorget's employment office. At frequent intervals, new shadowers took the place of the old ones. And as each man came off duty, he went directly to the employment office. By day and by night. Sleep and awake. until the final fatal moment. assassin was tried and mysteriously acquitted. And Alexander of Russia didn't forget it. When Bismarck goaded France into starting his war, Russia stayed on the sidelines. It was one of the shortest wars on record between two major powers. France crumpled like a piece of tissue paper in a mighty fist. Prussia took Alsace-Lorraine and in a few years a new name, the German Empire. Out of the humiliating war of 1870 grew such a hatred of the Hun by France that it was one of the major factors in beginning World War I. Steiber's notes and ledgers and files became the very foundation and prototype of all modern spy systems. Russia modeled her secret service after Steiber's. So did England. So did France, eventually. And, of course, so did the United States. I'll see you next week, won't I? I've got a little work to do in the meantime.